Hey there, we're so glad that you're joining us here on YouTube for more than you asked for. We want to encourage you to like and subscribe. That way you'll get all the updates every time we go live. Yeah, be sure to hit that bell so you get all of the alerts. Thanks for joining us. Well, hey friends. Hey, hey there. Great to be with you. Hey, great to be with y'all too. We're coming off a pretty cool weekend it here was. at Trinity Fellowship. Yeah. We had was. Beckett Cook with us. Which was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if you didn't get a chance to see it, I highly recommend that you go back and watch those videos and listen to the various podcasts, and whatever form you want. Beckett did an amazing job. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. so cool to hear his story and the transparency mm-hmm. with yes. which he tells his story and then um, helps you realize the real authority that he has to speak on such an important and hot topic right now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, you know, we could talk about these issues of homosexuality and the LGBTQIA plus whatever um, movement in culture, but it's really different whenever we recognize that we've got... Um, no, you're good. We're just adjusting it just a little bit. <laughs> we recognize it's really... Um, powerful when you have someone with a testimony yeah. mm-hmm. like Beckett's. And so when he is sharing that he adopted and lived within the postmodernism ideology for 40 years or so, and then to come out of that and to recognize, oh, wow, it's amazing mm-hmm. that truth is actually freeing and to adopt a postmodernism mentality ideology is not freedom mm-hmm. when everything is subjective, that that is just a weight that we're not intended to carry. And so that's so interesting because it is countercultural. I mean, and today's culture wants to say, oh, truth is whatever you want it to be. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't work. And it doesn't work. And it's great when you've got someone with the experience mm-hmm. like Beckett, who is willing to share his testimony. And then, oh, isn't God amazing? <laughs> yeah. And I He's thought amazing. it was so great the way Beckett even shared, you know, because he lived at what would be considered probably the pinnacle of what that lifestyle would look like. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's in Hollywood, he's hanging out with all the producers and movie stars and Mm -hmm. traveling to Paris and Milan and New York Mm -hmm. for Fashion Week. I mean, he was doing it all. And yet he still was, you know, able to just share. And and he found he was still empty. You know, it wasn't Mm -hmm. fulfilling. It wasn't giving him his life's purpose because it was outside of of God's purpose for his life. Mm -hmm. Right. It was amazing. Right. So he shared at our Sunday services, mm-hmm. and then we had our at our ten fifteen morning session. We did a Q and A with amazing. Beckett. That you can go and check out. And then last night, as we're recording this, he walked us through the answer the question, "How did we get here?" and walked us through a presentation. And then we had another Q and A um, with Beckett last night, and we still have a ton of questions. Oh my goodness, bunch to of, answer a bunch of unanswered <laughs> questions. Yes. So many unanswered questions. Yes. So y'all can go and listen to all the Q&A that we've done um, thus far. Beckett also has a great um, pod show and it's yeah, called does. the Beckett Cook Show and he answers, you know, some of um, some of these questions from his perspective on on his podcast there. But last night we had 100 exactly questions that were submitted. That's amazing. Q and a. And so what, I mean, it just tells us that it, it's a, a conversation that people are wanting to have Mm -hmm. and we have questions that need to get answered. And so let's get after it. So what we have here today are the rest of the questions that didn't, that uh, we didn't have time to answer. And we've kind of broken them down into uh, several broad categories and the first the first category in which we had the most questions is about conversations and how w- when we talk about what it looks like to love people our family our friends who are living this lifestyle i understand what the truth of what love actually is but how do i live that out what are some actual words you know that i can that i can say to to my family and my friends that will not push them away. I think mm-hmm. that the consensus is I don't want to push people away. I want to love them well, but I am, this is uncharted territory. How do I, how do I do it and do it well? So the, the first question here is what are the words to say when a friend or family member tells you that they are gay? Yeah, that's well, a tough, I definitely have some thoughts. <laughs> so, um, here we go because this was a little bit presented even last night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes, or yesterday even, I think that sometimes we would like to know a formula, mm-hmm. give me the formula and the exact precise words to say mm-hmm. that are going to unlock their heart 
set them free and they won't be mad at me. <laughs> yeah, and I will not have to pay any relational cost for yeah. And I won't right. have to pay a relational cost. And so here's the reality. It's kind of like um, sharing your um, or presenting the salvation message. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be different. The salvation message is, you know, is truth. That's the good news. Jesus Christ came. He paid, lived the life that we could not live. He lived a perfect life. He died the death that we should have died, paying the penalty for the punishment of our sins. He was he was sacrificed. He sacrificed his life. He was not killed. He sacrificed his life. He was um, dead. On, he died on the cross. He was raised alive three days later, and he is alive today. So then he forgives us of our sins. So the cross is victorious and he forgives us of all of our sins if we choose to make him the Lord of our life. So that means we're going to give him power and leadership over our lives. We're going to surrender our lives to him. Okay, so there's just of the basics of the gospel and the good news. But if I'm going to share that with someone, if they haven't asked me about that, I'm not just going to just blurt it out to them, right? Right. So I see this in a very similar way. How do we share the gospel? Whenever we've got maybe a teammate on a, you know, or a sports team or someone we see at the gym, someone we see at a restaurant, we don't just go out and just like, okay, let me tell you this good news. Unless Holy Spirit gives us that moment. Yeah, there's a prompting. So... But mainly how we express love to someone so that they are open to when it is time to share the gospel is by sharing the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. And so that, it, that means you are the message. So who it is that you are in Christ and how you display his character is the message. So I hear, and so I'm not going to not it, I'm not not answering the question, but I think sometimes um, the real effort really needs to be in how are we living our own lives, and are we demonstrating the life and the fruit, the life of Jesus, His nature, and are we demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit? So that means as we live our lives and ask Jesus to fill our hearts with love, to give hu- to give us His heart for his people, then it's so interesting because as he gives us his heart, not just what I think I should do or how I interpret how what someone should um, be living like or what I interpret um, how I should voice to them how mm-hmm. they should be living. Um, but instead, what it really is is like, okay, can I be a person who will pray for people? Lord, I just pray for people who are who do not recognize their identity. I pray for those. I pray that you will give me your heart for them. How much do you love them? How do you see them? Um, would you bring healing to their heart? So praying into these things ahead of time so that strongholds do come down ahead of time. And so that when people see us, they can see, you know, to some we will be the fragrance of Christ. Christ. To other, we're like a, a stench, a stench of death to them. So I'm not, I don't have to interpret, interpret how they're going to view me, but I can do something about the cultivating the nature of Christ. And so if someone presents themselves, let's say, it just depends on the relationship. Yeah, that's you really know, important. if they're a close friend, if they're a family member, um, well, I would hope that if we, we already love them and then we're going to continue to love them. We're going to continue to care for them. We're going to respect them and see them as the Imago Dei. We see that you are created in the image of God. Now, we can either be conformed to this world or we can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. But so some look more like Jesus and some, you know, and we get to continue in that for forever. And others may look less like Jesus, but they're still Um, created with inherent value, dignity, and honor because they are created in the image of God. So so truly, it has to do with how I am thinking of them, how I am praying for them, and how I am on the inside. And then that will be um, expressed by the way that I treat them externally. Am I willing to look them in the eye? 
And can I see past their sin? And can I see a person there? And every time with that, that's where there is so much sweetness. There is so much compassion. There is so much love. And if they're not bringing something up, I've just been amazed at all the things that we can take care of in the spirit realm by praying. And then we don't have to, it is not our responsibility to address every issue, but it is our responsibility to take it before the throne of God and be before him. If we can love someone, I wonder what would happen if we spent more time in prayer for people, maybe even proactively ahead of time, people that we haven't even encountered yet. And especially for those, if we already know that they're walking in that spending some time in prayer so that when and my ears are getting hot so that when we do have an occasion to either share with them or like Beckett's story he literally asked this group of people with bibles and said so what do y'all think about homosexuality Mm -hmm. (laughs) and their answer was we believe it's a sin (laughs) yeah they did and it's and he appreciated it in that moment because he was God had him in that moment. He also had family members who'd been praying for him. His entire family had been praying for him for for years. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of these people that we know have radical transformations, their, um, their family members had been praying for them for years. So it's not always necessarily about trying to pull together all the right words and having the right conversation tactics, but will we go before the Lord in prayer and say, in cultivate a heart for his people, take care of things in the spirit realm that strongholds will come down so that they can receive the revelation light of Jesus Christ. You may not be the harvester, someone else may be, but we've taken care of it in the spirit realm. So I don't want that to seem like I did not answer the question because I think that's like the easy, well, Will we pray? Will we take down strongholds over people's lives? Will we ask God for a heart for those who are lost and confused? Now, what I would say doesn't work is when we think, okay, I've got all these, I've got some good verbiage in me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm already, we're going to have Thanksgiving and I'm going to just say, well, did you know that you are created in the image of God? You know, Mm -hmm. I can have some of these little tactics and they're not going to, if they're not full of the spirit of God and they're not full of his love and it's not the right timing, it will not work. I can tell you, cause I've been a mom and it may not have been about these issues, but where I've kind of thought, or I am a mom, but I've had <laughs> uh, children in our home that we're training and raising and discipling. And sometimes I've thought, okay, I've got all my words. All right. And then if it's not the right timing, it just falls flat right. and it's not with the right spirit. It's like, no, I'm going to prove to you something that will never work. That'll fall flat. So I, I, I'm excited to hear what you're getting. All right. Well, time. thanks. So I'll, you know, I'll just be real specific. You know, as we're as we're answering this question, I agree 100 percent with everything Kim's saying. For one thing, we can trust in Holy Spirit. So when we're in a moment, we can trust that Holy Spirit is going to guide and direct us. But we got to got to tap into that and press into that. And and I would say this too: we need to not see this sin as something that is radically different from all other sin. So if somebody comes and confesses that they're into drugs, if somebody comes and confesses that, you know, they're into pornography, if they come and confess that they're whatever it is that they're sharing, you know, how we respond to that is we need to respond righteously. And the way to that would be, I love you. I care about you. You mean something to me. And and I would qualify that based upon what the relationship is, just like you said. You know, is this a coworker? You know, if I'm, in a, if, if I'm a coworker, I may not say love you. You know, if we haven't broached that with a coworker, <laughs> uh, I may not say love you. If it's a family member, though, I'm going to tell them straight up, I love you. But if it's a coworker, I say, man, I really care about you. And, um, and so I think, and in, in Beckett shared this really well this weekend, you know, the need to love and accept the person without accepting the behavior. And so that response can be something like this, you know. Man, I love you. I I care about you. You're very special to me, and nothing's going to change that. I get concerned about this path that you've decided to go on, mm-hmm. and you know. And and I always say this to sincere questions deserve sincere answers, and so we have to discern a little bit, you know, because sometimes people might even just be baiting us. You know, it, it, yeah. it's not even a sincere question. They're not, they're not asking us for our opinion. They know what our opinion is. They're they're wanting to have a fight about it, mm-hmm. and I would just say, well, let's don't give them. There's no value in that. There's no value in dealing with that. You know, I think about Jesus when he gave the parable of the of the son that wanted the inheritance. You know, the lost son, and the the youngest son goes to the father and says, "I'd like my inheritance." A very rude 
uh, inappropriate thing to ask for. But the father gave it to him. He gave the son his inheritance. And of course, we know the son went off and squandered it. And then he came back. And when the son came back, the father runs out and meet him. And of course, the entire story is about grace and how the father receives and restores the son and all those things. It was an amazing story. But when we think about this, Jesus was trying to give us a picture of our heavenly father. And God gave us free will. He gave us the ability to choose. And so if somebody says, you know, no matter what you say, I'm going down this path, and I've got one, one caveat to this here in just a moment. If somebody says they're going down this path, I think it's great that we say we love them, we affirm them, uh, but we're not going to affirm this behavior. Mm-hmm. And in fact, we say, you know, I, I, and I wouldn't go into it with them unless they ask me questions. I would say I'm very concerned about where this is going to lead. And I'm concerned about what it might do to, to you and, and how it's going to cause you hurt. And if they want to know more about that, well, what do you mean? What are you worried? You know, then we can have a conversation. Other than that, I would, I would leave it there. My one caveat, though, is if your kids come to you. Yeah. And when I mean kids, I mean still in your house, under your roof, mm-hmm. you know, living on your, on your um, uh, care. And I, I would respond very differently there. You know? well, that is one of our questions that came in. I mean, Good. very specifically, a mom with a uh, 17-year-old daughter who told her counselor about a year ago that, and this is it also hits on the transgenderism issue, that she's actually a boy in a girl's body and um, is, you know, coming out as homosexual at 17, still under the mm-hmm. parents' roof. And, and here the parents are saying we're heartbroken and concerned for her. And how can, how can we help her? And how can we pray for her? Yeah. Well, and I think, so now we're at 17. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's, let's, dis, let's differentiate between 17 and say 12, right? Yeah. I mean, those are five years, but it's radically different yeah. uh, in dealing with those two. Because at 17, you're almost an adult, mm-hmm. you know, they're almost the age. Um, what I would want to recommend with that one, there are some great resources out there. Help me remember that book from the... Mama Bear, no, no, Apologetics. No, not There's the Apologetics, the, the young lady that just detransitioned. Helena Kirshner, I that's it. is her name. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, there are different, um, a, a lot of people now in this, excuse me, a lot of people now in this time um, are coming out on the other side yeah. where they did experience um, going through the transgender um, transitioning and then are now speaking out about the harm of it. And so that might, those may be some yep. good resources mm-hmm. and we can maybe put some links here. So I know several people have interviewed I, I believe it's Helena Kirshner I believe I think is, that's exactly right one and there are, there are many others now and so that may be helpful um, to have but I do know that Mama Bear Apologetics has a book that's on um, guide to I believe it's guide to sexuality it's one of their it's their newer one mm-hmm. and it is also helpful and it's I have not gone all the way through that so I, I don't have that in me fully yet but I know that that's a good resource and I know something that um, we can do is continue to ask questions right tell me what makes you think yeah that you are a boy in a woman's body or vice versa and in that there is some very there you can um, get through some layers with that now unless they are just obstinate well you know you never know, but you can yeah. ask questions instead of telling someone mm-hmm. something. Right. Mm-hmm. Always so better. you can just ask, tell me more about that. Mm-hmm. Tell me what makes you think that, well, this is just how I feel. Well, what does that feel like then to be, um, you know, a male in a woman's body? To begin to just ask those questions. And most of the time, um, they many have just bought into a narrative yeah. because it was fed to them easily. And as they have bought into that, then maybe what they're really needing is, I need some attention. And it doesn't mean that their need for attention is not valid, but this isn't the right way to go about it. So if they're, um, we can just continue to give them some, give them some of the attention, especially as a parent. You bet. Well, tell me more about that. Well, let's have some conversations. Would you like to meet with a counselor? Would you like to meet with a pastor? And then making sure that, you know, I would meet with the pastor or or a minister or someone first, because you want to be sure that we are tender in these areas, not because, oh no, we're just afraid. They're just going to run away. But we want to be tender with something inside is not is not well something inside is needing is hurting so we don't that's why we don't want to approach something with that 
well, don't you know that's wrong or that's a sin? And, you know, let me just cast that out of you right now, you know? Well, not that something, we don't cast something out, but the person's still in there. We're going to minister to the person. Mm -hmm. There's a need there. There's a a care. Uh, And so sometimes it is an abuse. Sometimes it is um, something has been fostered there. And so there, you know, there are a lot of stories there, unfortunately, with, um, we live in a, in a corrupt, um, fallen world. And when we don't recognize that there is sin, we don't recognize a need for Jesus and a savior. And so in a world where everyone gets to make a decision, how they're going to live, then very sadly, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of access to wickedness in the world and boundaries get crossed and it brings greater harm to people and individuals. And so that now that doesn't mean we're going to care for people's hearts and where they need healing, but Jesus is our healer. Mm -hmm. So every single one of us needs healing and the devil is an opportunist. So it doesn't matter what age group he right. um, will cross boundaries. So that is why we pray for our children. We pray for protection over them. Don't ever turn a blind eye. Ask questions. Be proactive about those things. And then if a child or someone is needing healing, well, we can pray and we can have that healing. You can have a minister pray. You can have, um, all, you know, we have prayer team members who will pray for you. If, um, if you need to just talk through something, then that's why we are a body. God has created us to be a part of the body. I know I've had some things in my life that I thought, okay, Lord, let's just you and me take care of this. And he's like, no, you know, he's called me to be ministered to by others. And why is that? Because otherwise we would just resort to like, oh, I just got this by myself in Jesus. Well, we're not intended to just experience everything with just ourselves individually in Jesus. We're intended to be a part of a body and the body heals. And so we're the body of Jesus Christ. So there's healing that comes from the body. So that it's there and it is available and that can help shift um, wrong thinking and um, we can establish a truth instead of believing a lie. Yeah, it's good. Anything you want to add? No, let's go. What what else you got? I know we got a bunch of questions. We do have a bunch of questions. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and go to like the workplace. Yeah. And so there's a a thread running through several questions, some coming in from teachers that and very obviously, um, of course, apply to other work work scenarios that that are like this. I work in a job where acceptance is almost a requirement. I'm not allowed to speak truth to individuals struggling with LGBTQ issues. I don't want to be tolerant, but I also need and love my job. How do I love them without encouraging their choices when I can't speak truth directly? Yeah, you know, um, to say you can't speak truth directly, I don't want to, uh, I'm not doubting the question, um, but having been in the workplace and having uh, dealt with this very issue uh, with uh, folks that were both coworkers with me as well as subordinates to me, recognizing, no, there's ways to have this conversation. You know, when, when we use wisdom, and, and one thing to, 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 to remember, you know, our job is not to prevent the world from sinning. That is, that is not what we're about. So we're, we're not called to be the sin police. Now, there are people that God puts in our circle that we love and care for, and we want the best for them. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't matter to me whether, uh, when I was in the business world, whether it was the issue of homosexuality or if it was just straight up promiscuity uh, or if it was drinking too much. You know, If it was somebody in my circle of influence that I had the ability to connect with, I wanted to do what I could to help them wherever they were. You know, I, I had folks that were addicted to drugs and, and things about you know, how, how can I support them and help them get out of this? You know, how, how can we help? So it starts with what Kim already said. So I, I, I'm not, I don't want to reiterate it, but I want to make sure we keep this important. Never forget about prayer. And so make yourself a prayer list. Pray for these people. Let it be a part of your daily time of praying with God. Just, you know, even just a, you know, it doesn't have to be long. Just a one minute prayer for them. God, I pray for an open door so that I can talk to, you know, so-and-so about this and that you would touch their heart and, you know, I love them and care about them. So just a little prayer every day along the way and then watch God open up doors for you. And then, um, you know, I, something that Kim and I learned when we were doing Young Life years ago, when we were Young Life volunteers, is Young Life has a motto, earn the right to be heard. 
And that goes both to our own character, as Kim already shared, our own character, our own nature, making sure that we're doing that. But then on the other hand, investing sincerely, relationally with other people. Mm -hmm. And when we invest sincerely in other people, it provides opportunities then for us to speak into their lives. And I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a very specific circumstance and I'm going to be uh, intentionally vague on the details. Um, but it was a, a gentleman that worked for me that was living in a homosexual lifestyle. And, uh, and he knew I was a Christian. He knew my perspective on that. Uh, we never had to talk about it. That was just an unspoken. He knew, he knew where I stood on it. Uh, but he knew that I, I loved him literally and cared for him. And because over years of working together and, and being able to demonstrate that, it actually got to the point at one point where he was having trouble with his boyfriend and he was asking me questions and like, what do I do relationally? And I was like, well, man, I just, I just got to tell you, this kind of relationship doesn't work and here's why. And you're seeing the fruit of it. And I was able to share, have that conversation with him because I had earned the right to be heard. Uh, overworking, and he was coming to me for advice. And so just as we're sincere and we amazing. engage yeah, it with is. people, <laughs> you know, it, it allows us to have those those opportunities. And so, you know, what, one of the things that I was hoping, you know, as the pastor of bringing Beckett in is to, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, so you can help me just a little bit. I, I wanted to remove a little of the um, mystique, I guess, around the specific issue of homosexuality, mm -hmm. uh, because it is so prevalent as an issue in our culture today, where there's so many other sins that we think about all these other things. I mean, if we think about somebody that was, that was just go with drinking too much. I mean, we could all think about folks we know who've struggled with alcoholism and that sort of thing. Well, we just kind of know how to deal with that. We can talk to them. It's just something that we're not so uncomfortable talking about. That, that's my hope with this issue of homosexuality is it becomes not a normal sin. That's a terrible thing for me to say because I don't mean that like, oh, it's some, uh, I don't mean, it, mean that at all. But it becomes something that we're not afraid to talk about. We're not afraid to engage with. We're not afraid to read about. We're not afraid to learn. We're not afraid to pray. We're not afraid to engage and, and help folks in that area. But mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would say. You can always pray for opportunity and God will give you opportunities. Well, that's right. part of the politics with the culture right. is that mm -hmm. it is intentional like, oh, this is one of those things that you Christians better not touch this one. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, we are going to, you know, you're going to be, you're going to lose your job. You're going to, no. So now we've just made this like this idol that, no, you Christians may not agree with it, but you cannot touch it. And we're going to need you to bow a little bit every now and then. Yeah. So I think that's what I hear you saying is like, okay, don't treat it like that. Just recognize that this is one of those sins that is also like, as you, you know, any of the list of them. And I thought it was funny because I think, um, uh, Beckett was talking about the, you know, the gay pride, you know, parade or something. And, and then he said, well, there's not a greed pride parade. Right. There's <laughs> an not adultery an adultery pride, pride yeah. parade, you know? And so recognizing, helping us as Christians to recognize, well, how do you handle this and how do you share the gospel and the truth with people who are involved in the sin? The same way that you do with somebody who's involved in either um, drinking too much or is greedy or is yeah, their careers, their idol, whatever or it is. is immoral or it has, a, you know, a dirty mouth or whatever. Well, we're going to see the person. We're going to pray for them. We're going to see the person is created in God's image. And we're going to let the light of Jesus shine through us. We're going to earn the right to be heard. And so when earn, and you wait for those opportunities. And God shows you, even just in how you even just shared that about, you know, to have him, this man, ask you about, you know, can you give me advice on my relationship with my boyfriend? I'm like, well, you know, this isn't going to work. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like, well, you're going to burn in hell. No. You know, it wasn't that. But then too, so that was a business situation. So I would then say too, the world is craving for people. The world is craving for truth. Mm -hmm. In this season, in this time when there, everything is just subjective, the world is looking for light. They will be drawn to light. Mm -hmm. So don't minimize you being light. Nobody's telling you you can't be a Christian. Well, what else can you do if you can't address, would you, are you going to just address homosexuality in the classroom? I mean, probably that's not going to be the topic. Mm -hmm. Well, how about let's just teach them what you got to teach them and 
educate these children and let them know that you care for them because Mm -hmm. you're willing to help them. You're willing to help them learn. You're not looking at them in a weird way. God, show me how to love them in in the way that they, that I, they know that they are seen, Mm -hmm. that they're true hit, um, imago day is being seen and is being appreciated now again it's not a guarantee because you know some to your fragrance to others you're a stench of death but nobody's telling you you can't be who you can't radiate the love and the life of jesus christ radiate it even more ask god for creative ways to um to be a good instruction instructor a good teacher um don't uh, don't ba- don't be so let's not be so concerned about what we can't do that we forget what it is that God has called us to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and can I yeah. add something to that too? And and also, don't think that we have to do it all. Same thing with the gospel. It, you know, we don't. You know, some Jesus says some plant, some harvest. Yeah. You know, so there's sometimes we don't even know what we're what little we're doing. And I'm I'm thinking of we had an encounter. Uh, just a couple of weekends ago over Labor Day weekend, we were up in uh, Washington, D.C. visiting Knox and Jabin, our kids there, and we were getting ready to go to dinner. And uh, we were in the lounge of the restaurant because they were waiting for our table to be ready. And kind of seated right next to us was a very obviously uh, a trans, um, I'm sorry, I don't know which one you're supposed to say first, but it was a, a biological male who was wearing a dress and very obviously uh, a wig and a dress And uh, so obviously a trans person sitting right next to us and they were by themselves. They didn't have anybody with them. So you can, I mean, that alone tells you a ton. And so uh, we waited for an opportunity. We were, you know, are we going to prophesy? Are we supposed to pray? What are we supposed to do? But we're praying. But we're praying for this individual literally right next to us. And, uh, and then they bring him out a uh, dessert with happy birthday on it. It was like, oh, it's your birthday. <gasps> and so we were able to turn to him. Yeah, now, so now you think about the moment. They're alone on their birthday uh, in this place and being judged by you know so many people. So it, it, here's the thing. Nobody was seeing this person. Ugh. And so we just turned to him and just engaged. Like, hey, how are you? You know, happy birthday. That's awesome. And we just started up a dialogue and just tried to encourage them on their birthday. And 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 that was really it. And they ended up, you know, frankly inviting us to go out to some bars with him, which we said, no, thank you. We're, <laughs> we're, we're good. We're going to wait and eat. And uh, you go ahead. Aww. But uh, but just a, an opportunity, and I don't know, just to, to pray for him and have an yeah. encounter there. So just be sensitive to people. And God will open up an opportunity for you to... To do it, and, and I would say one more thing to folks, um, you know, and this kind of goes back to the outlier series that I preached earlier in this year. One of the things we have to recognize is we've, as Christians, had it really easy. And if you go back to the first century church and and really a lot of the church over the years, you know, we, we don't really face persecution and never have had to face persecution in the United States. Mm-hmm. But we're moving into a season now where there is an attack on the constitution specifically on freedom of religion and freedom of speech and the very areas that we're talking about here and we got to recognize that if if we don't use our voice and if we don't stand up and say you know what I'm a Christian and you have to, you know I'm not giving up my religious beliefs you know I'm, this is not what we're talking about here but this whole idea with vaccines and vaccine mandates you know uh, we have some friends that um, because of their religious beliefs did not get the vaccine and they were concerned and they were in the military and they were in a situation where they were told they were going to have to leave. And then lo and behold, the lawsuits came through mm-hmm. all of that. You know, it made huge news when the president said that all military have to get vaccinated. And then about eight months later, when it finally goes through the court systems and it turns out, nope, they need to grant their religious exemptions. And now this friend that I'm thinking about, the, the military invited him back. Like, hey, come on back. You know, <laughs> wow. don't, don't leave yet, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and others. And, of course, that, that gets downplayed. But when you, when you stand for what you believe in, we, you know, we're going to face some persecution. And sometimes that's not a, that's not a bad thing. And if, mm-hmm. if we're dependent upon our job, I, I would just very mm. gently say this because I know we all have – decisions we have to make. But if we're going to value the security of our job over the truth of, of standing on what we believe in, let's, let's not cave into our, let's not cave our values for the sake of a paycheck. Yeah. And let's trust God enough that if, and I'm not saying again that we do things flagrantly or, you know, I, I understand that there are boundaries that need to be observed, but let's, let's don't give up 
our, our moral values mm-hmm. and simply because we value our job and value our paycheck. God's got that. You see that with Beckett's story. 100%. I mean, he, he was able to stay in his industry for a while, but he said when it was when his book came out that he just got absolutely blacklisted, blacklisted, literally canceled. And, but he counted it all as loss, you know, right. except for like knowing Jesus That's and right. that God would, God would provide for him. And then, and he has. And so I love that part of his story. I love that too. And he does refer to Philippians 3, 8, which is, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, Mm -hmm. for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. So I do believe that we are in a time and a season that, and I'm not suggesting anyone is lukewarm, but I'm just talking about this at to be lukewarm um, isn't going to cut it anymore. That's right. Yeah. Because now then we've got to make a decision. Sometimes how we feel is like, man, everything was going along. I don't want anything to change. I love my job. I've been here for a long time. I like what I get to do. And I think that's wonderful. I'm just so grateful for all the professions. When you have somebody who says, I love what I do. And now they're having to navigate some difficult things. Well, I would say exactly that. Okay, one. It's time to really revisit who your Lord is. Is was it just that? Hey, I liked everything was going along smoothly. Smoothly, I like I knew what I was called to. Everything made sense. I didn't have to pray about my job. I didn't have to pray about how to do my job. Now I feel stressed. I don't like this. Things mm-hmm. are changing. I don't like it. The app, the Apple card is upset. You know, somebody who did this. Now I'm just like, oh, give me a magic word give me a a, something to file you know give me a petition to sign and all of my troubles will go away that's not going to be the reality so we've just got to know that and that's part of facing the brutal facts it's not going to just be a one and done thing we're we're in a war here so it'll be a battle but i would say first you've got to decide who are you going to serve who's your love who is your first love Jesus Christ. Okay, now I've got to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, what are you calling me to in this season? And then you've got to know that you know that you know that either God is calling you to continue to work in that workplace or he is calling you out into something else. And both take faith. Yeah. It takes faith to know like, okay, no, I know God's called me into this medical field. I know God's called me into this area of the military. I know God's called me into ed, in, into ed, the education system. So when you know, then you're like, okay, God is a good God. Anything that you need and that God's called you to, he will provide. So he is going to either provide w- um, new creativity in how you, um, what it is that you do and how you navigate. And it might be a day to day, moment by moment thing. But then you know, I know God's called me here. Mm-hmm. I know he's called me here. And there's such a peace and mm-hmm. there's a competence and a, a confidence that comes with that because we know what God has called us to. Yeah. So when the fire comes, I'm like, okay, Lord, I guess I'm going to come out of this with some more gold because. Yeah. This is uncomfortable, but I think we've got to learn to get um, a little more comfortable. comfortable. Yeah, a little more comfortable (laughs) with being uncomfortable. That is why we have Holy Spirit as the comforter. Mm -hmm. Why would we need Holy Spirit to be our comforter if we didn't need, weren't going to need some yeah. comfort along the way. So you've got to know some of those things. And I think it's also very interesting. Don't limit God and what he can do. He may, I mean, new schools have formed because, you, you know, parents are being obedient to what it is that God's calling them to. So now there are new opportunities and new ways to teach in um, new, in, and in new kids schools educated. and yep. new education. Um, I think it was the president of Hillsdale who was talking about anything up to high, through high school is basic knowledge and information that is being taught. So he just said, you don't have to have a lot of extra um, education to educate a child through high school. So sometimes we're a little bit like, oh no, well, who will educate my children? Or what, you know, well, let's let's not make some things so too grandiose. Um, God's, uh, every with a big God, there is everything else becomes, um, is manageable and minuscule compared to our very big God mm-hmm. in our time. So. That's good. 
All right, one more scenario in the same vein. We covered some ground here, but this one's a little bit, just a little bit different that I want to see if you would add anything to. So this is um, a couple of questions came in about the, these are parents, stepmom and stepdad, who biological parent mm -hmm. who the parents are split up biological parent is homosexual and living that lifestyle and they have shared custody and so the they have no choice but for the child to live in that environment do you have any advice or help mm. for the other set of parents oh, wow man, that's so hard i have a lot of compassion in that yeah. in that circumstance mm -hmm. you know um the only Jesus. advice that i would have would be to regularly speak truth and you know God can redeem any circumstance for your children in that case. But I would encourage them, you know, well, here, here's what I believe. Let me, let me start with this. The wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, it was really helpful for me to, to talk to Beckett personally as well as what he shared uh, from the stage with us. You know, the, the lifestyle, the homosexual lifestyle is a dark, dark lifestyle. And again, we know the wages of sin is death. Jesus, God did not prohibit homosexuality because he's mean. He did it because he knows it leads to death. And so what I would you do is I would use that as an opportunity. Again, totally age dependent. You know, we don't know what age. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this with kindergartners, but as we start getting older, I would just make sure that we can have open, honest, frank conversations about why that's wrong, about why we don't do that, about why we don't believe that's true, but why we still love mom or dad, whoever the person is, uh, we love them, but we disagree with the lifestyle and just keep that very reinforced because what's going to happen is the kids are going to end up with a front row seat to the disaster that's going to come. Mm -hmm. And when we're showing truth with love on a regular basis, uh, that's going to be real helpful for them to be able to see it and then help them make the decisions that they need to make in life. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And to, I mean, you know, I mean, it's hard, but to pray for that other parent for sure. And, you know, to pray with your children, to pray for them that, and it doesn't have to be just, you know, the specific, you know, take them out of that homosexual, you know, lifestyle. It could be if they know what that is, but you can always pray for the light of Jesus mm -hmm. to fill every layer of their soul and for their mind to be bound to the mind of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You can pray for them in that way. And you can pray Romans 5.5. 5. You can pray, Father, I pray that your love will fill their heart by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you'd bring healing to every area of their life, that there would be no fracture in their life in Jesus' name. So you could pray that, but that's also what you would pray if a parent is in a... Um, is does not know Jesus yet, mm -hmm. or if they're living in an immoral lifestyle, you can still pray for those parents and to pray with the, your children, mm -hmm. uh, to pray with your children for those parents and pray in all those wonderful ways. And God will answer those prayers. He does answer prayer. And so let's, I, I just keep going back to, I just believe that we're called to we're called to pray, and if we recognized the power of our prayers, I think there that we would be praying more than um, being too worked up about what do I say or what do I do. Right. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, let's shift to talking about Christianity and the LGBTQ plus um, lifestyle. So, I mean, of course, in progressive Christianity, like they, they are adopting homosexuality as an acceptable lifestyle choice and in many cases are using scripture to back up that claim that God say trying to use scripture trying trying to use scripture um, to back up that claim that God actually affirms um, homosexuality and so there are several questions along this vein you know and um, we might go a couple of different places from here but the 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 main question is, how do I respond to people who use the Bible to affirm homosexuality and get very specific with examples and I can't rebut it? For example, um, someone claiming that the word homosexuality did not exist before the 1940s. And so it was something that was inserted later that people who disagreed with homosexuality inserted later. And so that throws out that the whole argument about yeah. homosexuality in the Bible. 
Yeah, and, and one thing I would say too, and I, and I would encourage people on this, this goes back to what I said earlier, sincere questions deserve sincere answers. So I'm always cautious when somebody comes to me with what they think is a ready-made answer, and they're not, they're not really trying to have a conversation. They're really just trying to tell me why they're right and I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Those are not conversations that I spend much time in. Yeah. And so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to feel like they've got to defend against an aggravated, intentional person who's going to pervert the truth anyway. So, yeah. uh, so I wouldn't do that. But at the same time, we ought to be educated enough that we have confidence in our perspective and that we can answer a sincerely seeking person. Mm-hmm. So if somebody is sincerely seeking. So, you know, I would start with this and it's give, just give us a couple of verses. So in Leviticus chapter 19, this course is the Old Testament. This would be the law. And it talks about holiness and personal conduct. And it goes through a whole bunch of things. Don't, don't deceive. Don't cheat each other. Don't bring shame on the name of the Lord by swearing falsely. Don't, don't defraud or rob your neighbor. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just this list. And I'm literally just reading the list. Uh, don't spread slanderous gossip. And all those things. It goes down uh, to even starting in verse 20, where it starts talking about what sex is okay and what sex isn't okay. And so it gives a whole long list of uh, what that could be. And it gets us down. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I need to get 18. Let me back up. That's 19. If I back up to 18, there's uh, forbidden sexual practices, the entire chapter of 18. And it goes through all the different. You know, don't uh, don't violate your father by having sexual relations with your mother, you know, obviously. And it goes down and lists a whole bunch of other ones. And it gets to verse 22. And it says this, Do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman, it is a detestable sin. And so, you know, uh, uh, you know, verse 23, A man must not defile himself by having sex with an animal. And a woman not, must not defile, offer herself to a male animal or have intercourse with it. I mean, this is how specific the Bible is being, mm-hmm. right? And, that, and that's the reason I'm, I'm not trying to be gross by reading these verses. I'm just reading the Bible. But the Bible is very specific about this kind of sin. And, you know, the word for homosexuality, I, I don't have any idea of the entomology of the beginning of the word for homosexuality. I do know that the word that can be translated is sodomy, uh, which is probably an older word that I think has been replaced with homosexuality. And so, you know, if that's what that person is thinking, that would be the only thing I could think on that. In uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13, we get the penalty. If a man practices homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman, both men have committed a detestable act. They must be both put to death, uh, for they are found guilty of a capital offense. So, I mean, that is one of the capital offenses, and there were several of those for the law, that if somebody was caught in something, uh, they were they were to be killed. And that was how strongly God felt about that in the Old Testament. We know that in Genesis 19, Uh, This is the story of Abram and Lot, uh, Abraham and Lot, and Lot's living in Sodom, which is where we get the word sodomy from. And it was all about the the place was just a a horrible sin in this entire city, and God ultimately destroyed the city because of their their sexual sin, uh, in particular homosexuality. And so we see in the Old Testament, God's very strong. And a lot of people have said, okay, well, that was the, the Old Testament. Now we have the law or that was the law, now we have grace, Jesus has died for all of our sins, so what does the New Testament say? And really the best verse on this, um, there's a couple of them, one of them is Romans chapter 1, in verse 20 through, is that what you got up there, babe? You want to read that? Yeah, you start right there. Yeah, what I think, because I think it's so important, so this is Romans 1, verse 18, it says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, which I think that's just really key right there, recognizing they suppress the truth and its wickedness. So they know the truth about God because he hasn't made it obvious to the because he has made it obvious to them and he continues. And so um, he says they have no excuse for not knowing God. I'm going to go down to verse um, 21, which I think is interesting. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I mean, that sounds like today. So claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. 
As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal um, praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. So it just continues on to show that they, their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed. I mean, those are evil too. Mm-hmm. Sin, greed, hate, mm-hmm. hate. Envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So these are this is what happens when we choose any other truth, any other way, other than God's truth and His way. So obviously, these things are not acceptable to God. He says these things mm-hmm. are shameful. And because they didn't want to repent, they're, He's like, okay you are going to be left to your own consequences if that's the decision that it is that you make. And when you read through this list, they're not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and one other verse, and then we can just kind of maybe close off on this topic as we just talk about it. But this is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. This is the Apostle Paul speaking again. He says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so here Paul's giving something real clear, that, and and this is a question that comes up pretty regular, and that is, can a person who is a homosexual and living in a homosexual lifestyle, can they go to heaven? And in this verse, Paul says very clearly that those who practice these things, and notice it includes drunkenness and fits of anger, and so it's not just homosexuality, but any of those things, those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That does not mean that they won't necessarily go to heaven. The kingdom of God is not referring to heaven per se as eternity, but it's referring to his kingdom here on the earth. It's the area of God's blessing and his provision. And so what he's saying is, is, look, you may have accepted Jesus and be on your way to heaven, but if you are practicing these things, you're not going to experience the blessings of God in your life. You're not going to get to inherit God's kingdom. And now then I've got to add a caveat to that, and that is, but if you continue to, in other words, if you if you just do one of those things, I mean, who, which one of us, if we're honest, hasn't at least done one of those things on the list, mm-hmm. right? There's a reason we need Jesus. There's a reason mm-hmm. we need the blood of Jesus. <laughs> But if we're regularly practicing that and we're satisfied where our life is in that, then we've got to ask ourselves, have I really made Jesus the Lord of my life? And if we haven't made Jesus the Lord of our life, then our eternity is, is, uh, is not good. I mean, the, the Bible is very clear about that. And so when, when people, and, and this is where I would encourage everyone who's listening, you know, biblical hermeneutics, which is the, the study of the Bible, how we study the Bible, one of the things that's important to see is, is that we look at the Bible as a whole and we look at the themes that are in the Bible and we don't just pick out one verse. And, and what I hear a lot happening with those who are, are trying to say that the Bible you know, somehow uh, condones homosexuality, you have to ignore a bunch of verses or you have to really twist them. And, and you have to go to some obscure possible Greek translation that you know is clearly not in the context of the of the scripture. It's clearly not what was being talked about 
when we have several other areas that are very clear and it, it's very straight. And in, in this particular verse, you know, I, I know I've had people tell me, well, that, that word for homosexuality there really isn't homosexuality. No, it's sodomy. It's, it's literally, uh, in fact, I would say this. If you wanted to get technical, that particular word in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians is not talking about women who are in a homosexual relationship. It is only talking about men. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we want to get really precise. But clearly, Paul's intention is not to make it gender specific. He's clearly just giving a list of, of behavior and saying, don't do these things. And that's consistent with the Old Testament. It's consistent with the rest of the New Testament. It is consistent with you know, the, the teachings of everyone for thousands of years, both before you know, the Old Testament going way before Jesus for thousands of years and then along with Jesus and all the way past till today. So it's very clear where Scripture stands on the issue of homosexuality. Right. Now let's move to our next section, which there are several questions about trauma and abuse that I I can sum up this way. It is said that many homosexual individuals say they were molested as a child. What aspect of that in those encounters leads to someone wanting to embrace a gay or lesbian lifestyle? And how much do we think that early childhood trauma actually contributes to later choosing a homosexual lifestyle? You know, I was, I was talking with Pastor Jimmy Evans about this, and, and he reminded me uh, about this, about the whole issue of homosexuality in Beckett this weekend, and we were, we were just talking about that. And he reminded me, you know, we did the Elephant uh, in the Room series, yeah. you know, gosh, 10, 12 years ago. I can't even remember long how long it was. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to remember the speaker. Maybe one of y'all can remind me. But we had a gentleman who came out of the homosexual lifestyle, and this mm-hmm. was his testimony. And his testimony was, that uh, he was molested as a young man. And then as he entered into puberty and began to grow, he had that, uh, that abuse was in his memory. And it ultimately helped to shape him uh, as he emerged into adulthood to where he assumed that he was gay because he was abused by a, a male figure in his life. And that certainly is a common theme but it is not the only thing. And so I, I do think that is a common theme that we can see, but we can't point to it and say that's, that's the, you know, the sole cause or the, the root of it. And I love what Beckett said. I thought he answered this so well. You know, there's three kind of theories on how people end up uh, in, a, in a homosexual, uh, being a homosexual, uh, using Beckett's words. One was, you know, there's some studies that have been done about the hormones and how they uh, land in your mother's womb and the functionality and how that has an effect on the brain. Uh, there's some studies that have been done on genetics to see if there's, you know, kind of the gay genetics. Is there a gene that makes us more uh, gay or not? And then there's kind of the uh, sociological, the the environment. You know, what, did we have a grandma that dressed the boys up as a girl or the girls up as boys or encouraged different behavior? Was there some sort of thing or, or, or trauma abuse like we're looking at here? And there could be various, and, and I love what Beckett said, there could be various things, but the reality is we live in a fallen world. Homosexuality is a sin. There's no excuses. There's, there's no, there's, there, that, that eliminates excuses off the table where Jesus died so that we might be forgiven of our sin and that we might be able to then move into the, become a new creation. And so whatever the past was, and, and if there is past trauma, well, let's get ministry for that. Let's get healing for that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and let's try to work on that. But let's don't, um, you know, it, it, I think there's a similar conversation that goes around with alcoholism. You know, what, what causes somebody to be alcoholic? Well, we do know that some people have more of a propensity towards addiction than others. Um, it's still destructive. It's still clearly what we're not supposed to do and, and, you know, let's, let's get help and let's go in a different direction. Good. You, you yeah. Think that? yeah. Um, well, I just think it's important. John 15, nine, I like the way the passion translation is. It says, Jesus says, let me continually nourish your heart. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate that the Lord let my love continually nourish your heart. I appreciate that Jesus is telling us you're going to have a need for my love to nourish your heart. Mm-hmm. And so if our heart has been wounded, then we need the love of Jesus to nourish it. So to ask Jesus, Jesus, I need your love to nourish my heart. I need you to bring healing where I have had trauma. I need healing where I've been abused. Instead of wearing it, and I mean this with all respect, 
But like, God's not glorified by us walking around with our hurt as like a merit badge. That doesn't bring honor to God. He paid the price for us to be healed. So if he paid the price for us to be healed, that means it's a real, it can be our reality. So it's up to us to just, that's where we can appropriate the, the truth of Jesus Christ, whether we're asking for healing from allergies or, exactly. you know, something that is, you know, whether it's healing from um, a trauma or an abuse, then Lord Jesus, you paid the price for me. You were... Your, by your stripes, the whippings that you took on your back, I am healed and I appropriate that truth. And that's what faith is. I'm choosing to trust in him that he is a healer. He is the great physician. And I like what, um, let's see here, Third John 1, 2 says, it says, um, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as your soul prospers. So we are connected. We're whole beings. So our physical bodies are impacted by our the health of our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotions. So we need healing to come to our thoughts, Everybody our memories. Does. We need healing to come to our will. We need submission to choose to submit my will to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ as an act of my will. I can choose to do that and ask him to bring healing and strengthening to our emotions so that we're not, we can have healthy emotions so that we're not just either emotionally shut down or emotional about everything. Um, which is important. So we're a whole being. So we go to the Lord to ask him to bring healing, to let his love nourish our hearts. I know I have personally received so much healing by what we would call soaking, Mm -hmm. going into God's presence and saying, Lord, I just need you to come and fill my heart. I need you to saturate my soul with your love, your life, and your light. Wash me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Heal me where I don't even know that I need healing. Because the reality is, We all need healing every single day, whether it is something that, you know, we felt rejected by a friend, we didn't get invited to a party, someone didn't talk to us, someone thinks differently than I think, you know, Um, we need, we need our souls to be continually healed and nourished. And as parents, we can do that for our children. We don't even have to talk about all the specifics. If you don't even know, it's just like, you know what, we're going to sit in the presence of the Lord. We're going to just let his love fill and nourish our hearts and that's a great way to stay healthy. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's good. All right. One more question, which is, what is it going to take to come out of the homosexual movement? Is it possible to shift the whole culture? Well, that's a great question. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm reading a book, and, and Beckett recommended it. Okay. And, uh, and so I'm about to do what I'm about to say is probably not the right way to do this because I kind of skipped to the last chapter. Oh my gosh. And I, I read, cause I wanted to see where this thing was going and I, I kind of read the headline then I went back. So I know he's going to say, but I have no idea how he's going to get there. So, uh, but it's, it's Truman, Carl Truman, who wrote in a couple of he's incredible okay. books. And so when Beckett was going through his whole list of Rousseau and Marx, and this was Truman, this was Truman's work. And that's the, the book in, that we're talking about. And uh, in his opinion, I know that, that he's putting forward at the end of the book that I don't know how he gets there is that, yes, we do get out of it as a culture of it being as, uh, as centric as it is right now. Uh, because we just, this trajectory just cannot continue uh, mm-hmm. on, on the level it is. But there's going to be a lot of carnage between here and there, and there's a lot of work that we've got to do. So I, I really do believe that we can get some, some sanity back into our culture. But I know this, the enemy's not going to stop. The, the devil's not going to stop. Um, th- this is not going to go away as an issue that we have to address. It, it, put it this way, we're not going back to pre-1950. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, well, this is where I'm so thankful that we have Jesus, right? So, and y'all are familiar with this, but Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name, which means that's the church, God's people called by His name, Christians, believers, the ecclesia, if we not the world, if we as the church will humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our own wicked ways, 
God promises he will hear from heaven and he will forgive our sins and restore our land. And this is just so powerful that again, if we go before the Lord, we take responsibility instead of seeing everything like, oh my gosh, what's the next thing Disney's going to do? Oh my gosh, I can't even watch TV with my kids. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen with my children, you know, or my job? Um, God's saying, okay, well, I guess what I would go to in, in every circumstance has, have we done this? Have we gone before the Lord and have we been honest with him about ourselves? Have we known him as our Lord, as our savior, as the one who has supreme power and leadership over my life that will I quit? Sometimes I just wonder like, well, how important is this to us? Mm -hmm. You know, am I willing to maybe miss a meal? to maybe pray so that I can focus in to pray about this. God, I'm just going to pray this one scripture. I don't know. I, did, I just heard this one scripture, so I'm just going to pray this one scripture. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek your face, God. What does that look like to seek the face of God? That means I'm not so focused in with everything else, but I'm focused in on God. I'm not just looking like, well, but my career, yeah, my education, my job, my status. I am looking to the face of mm -hmm. God. Lord, what is it that um, you look like? What does your righteousness look like? And I'm going to turn from my wicked ways. That means I might have to stop doing something. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it means that, you know, gosh, there's just too many hours spent in front of a, you know, a favorite Hulu show or something. It might just, I've had shows that God's just said like, no, no. No, really, I meant yeah. no the first time. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, I knew it. <laughs> but And I'm not talking like just something horrible, mm -hmm. but it is difficult to find something that is funny, mm -hmm. you know, funny and lighthearted. Yeah. But then when there are just some of those off-color things and you're like going, oh, you know, well, I'm going to uh, blah, 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 you know, okay, you know, wash that off. Um, but when the Lord's like, you know, after a while when you just feel like, I feel gross yes. after just watching a 30-minute segment. And if he just says no, then can we turn from our wicked ways and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I wasn't sensitive to you even. I pretty much told you no, you know, the first time. So what does that look <laughs> like for each of us? How do we get, how did we get here? It was a gradual process. And so um, what if we start looking at our own lives? Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to say we're goody two shoes, but we could just, God, I'm going to look to you and I'm just going to do what it is that you are calling me to. Show me how to have so much fun in life and how to radiate your glory in such a wonderful way that I'm, that people want to come and hang out with us to see, well, what are y'all doing? Oh, you're not doing what everybody else is doing that they've been doing since high school, you know? Um, this is fun. Fun. It's fun to hang out with people like you who are full of light and not feel guilty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I do believe, can this nation turn around? Absolutely. And what I would say is that we've got a responsibility. All I'm responsible for is what I, God has called me to do. So if each individual one of us will be responsible for um, doing mm -hmm. Second Chronicles 714 here and then just do the one thing or those things that God calls you to do one thing at a time, we can absolutely shift this culture. So I would even say one of those things can even be um, choosing to register to vote. That's right. Go and mm -hmm. vote. You know, do a, spend a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of time. But even if you spent, oh gosh, it feels like forever, an hour and a half doing a little bit of, you know, cross-referencing and researching, you know, that makes a difference. An election makes a difference. Mm -hmm. If God's people will get registered and they will go vote, it makes a difference as to who it is that we will um, we will have in our government. Okay. And, and I will say uh, the, the battle lines are going to be drawn around freedom of religion and freedom of speech. And so we've got to recognize that as Christians who want to exercise our freedom of religion and freedom of speech, those are the areas we're going to get tested on. Well, thank you guys for answering these big questions today. When we also talked about several resources throughout our conversation, so we'll be sure and link, you know, even Helena Kirshner's story in the book you just referenced, Pastor Jimmy. Um, but one of the you know, important things and pieces of our conversation was that we need to pray. And so, Pastor Kim, would you pray us out today? Oh, I would love to. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for 
your love, and we thank you f- that you are a God of hope. And I pray Romans fifteen thirteen over every listener. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Father, that hope helps us to trust in truth. And I thank you that your truth is You are the truth and you set us free. And so, Father, I just decree um, the love of truth over every listener. And Lord, for every friend and everyone that we love who is in a lifestyle that is compromised in any way, especially if it if they're involved in the LGBTQ plus um, culture, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would shine your loving light on their lives mm. in Jesus' name, that your light would pierce through the darkness, that you would flood their minds and their thoughts and their hearts with your light in Jesus' name, that you would bring healing to every layer of trauma and anywhere where there is darkness or there are lies. I pray that you would shine your light of truth. And Father, would you fill their hearts with so much love? Would you um, destroy any stronghold that would keep them from receiving the light of the truth of Jesus Christ? So I pray that they would know you, Jesus Christ, and for who you truly are. You're not the one who's trying to destroy fun. You're the one that's trying to wrap them up in your love, heal them, and bring them and release them into a abundant life that is full of fun, that is full of joy, that is full of true pleasure. And so Jesus, I pray that you would make yourself known to every single individual, that they would know how significant they are, that they are created in your image, and they would be transformed into your likeness. That's what we pray for each of us and for all that we love. And we thank you, God, that you have sent Jesus Christ in Jesus' You are the answer. We give you praise. Amen. Amen. Amen.